over the past. How did I get up there? Um, um, as I have shared the past uh, two weeks, there's been a lot of significance placed on the um, last words of someone. And in the New Testament, uh, or in the Bible, that, that is true as well, but even more significance is placed on uh, the first words that was spoken. When, and, I, and I've shared this before, that whenever there's a biblical truth that we're trying to, to, to understand, the way to get the best understanding of that is to go back in the Bible to the first place that principle is mentioned and then from that, we get a really good understanding of what God is meaning by that. And we can build a revelation upon that. And so we have been looking for the last two weeks at the very first of all of the first mentions in the Bible. And that was the first words that were spoken by God. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, said, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So in, in this, these two verses, we see God at the beginning, and as I stated before, it wasn't the beginning of God. What's hard for us to wrap our minds around is the fact that God always was, always will be. You know, we, we think in human terms because we have a beginning, and then we can have an ending, you know, an ending here on this earth, but then we live for eternity somewhere, hopefully with Jesus. Um, but God had no beginning and no end. And I just, that's the, really, that's the only thing I have to wrap my faith around and really believe in faith that God always was and always will be. And then everything else falls into place. If you believe in evolution and other things, there's a lot of things that you have to believe in for that to happen. But all we have to believe in is God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And so the first words that God said were, and when I, I'm sure he spoke before, but the first words, recorded words, that apply to us is let there be light. And these words were significant because they initiated three things. And this is what we've been looking at. First, when God said, let there be light, light manifested. Now, we know it wasn't the sun or the moon because they were created on the fourth day. But because God is light, that meant that his light was manifested in our galaxy and, and connected with us. The second thing that happened when God said, let there be light, the ultimate conflict was defined because light was divided from the darkness, which defined the conflict. There's a battle between light and darkness that we go through and we deal with all of the time. Then the third thing that happened when God said, let there be light, man's purpose was foreordained. Our ultimate purpose is to be light. So evil's in the world. There's a battle between good and evil. And it's going to be that way until Jesus returns. The battle has intensified in the last two years in this country. I told you about that last week. We talked about the political divide and the cultural divide. If you weren't here this last week, you can get the CD of that. It's very important. So we looked at the beginning of evil. It was the very creation of man that brought evil into the world. Now, it wasn't man himself that brought evil, although man was the one that sinned and opened the door for death, disease, sickness to enter into the world and a separation from God. But it was because of man, because of the position and the place that man had in the heart of God. God created man in his own image and he created him to be just a little bit below God. And that was the place that Lucifer wanted. And because of man, Lucifer rebelled. He was kicked out of heaven. And then he tempted man and man fell. So the battle between light and darkness is what we experience on a daily basis. So this morning, I want to continue and finish this by looking at man's mandate. So first, let me sum up what's happened in the past in the conflict between light and darkness. With the first move, God created angels and then he created man in his image. Lucifer then rebelled. God countered by casting Lucifer out of heaven. Satan countered by getting man to turn against God and come under his control. God countered by providing a redemptive covering for Adam so that Adam and Eve could be restored back to God. Satan countered by having Cain kill Abel. 
in an attempt to cut off the godly line. God countered by the birth of Seth because of that, the birth of Seth, that the scripture says that man began to call upon the name of the Lord again. Satan countered through the birth of Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel to create a kingdom in defiance of God. God countered by going to Ur of the Chaldeans and, and, and picking out Abram and, and, and having him to establish a nation. Satan countered by getting Israel trapped in Egypt where Pharaoh would not let them go. God countered by going to Moses in the land of Midian and having Moses come and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Satan countered by having Pharaoh attempt to wipe out Israel as they were trapped at the Red Sea. God countered by opening up the Red Sea and having Israel walk across on dry ground. And then as the Egyptians tried to get across, he closed the sea and all of them were, were drowned. Satan countered by having Israel serve pagan gods and then be oppressed by surrounding nations. God countered that by raising up judges that would deliver Israel from those nations. And then the whole Old Testament, it seemed like it was move and counter move and move and counter move. And on the surface, you know, one that's reading it couldn't see who was winning because it looked like it was just this battle that wasn't going to have a resolution. And at the end of the Old Testament comes 400 silent years. The New Testament opens up with all those begats until it comes to Joseph and Mary. In the Old Testament, God would use a man and then Satan would use a man. So God says, I'm tired of this. So that so let me just come down and take care of this mess myself. And so God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ, born as a baby in a manger. And Satan countered that by having Herod murder all the babies in an attempt to kill Jesus. Jesus God countered that by warning Joseph in the dream. And, and Joseph took Jesus and Mary into Egypt and later on brought them back to Nazareth. And Jesus entered into his ministry. Satan countered that by tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus countered that by speaking and declaring the word over him to break that, that temptation. Satan countered by getting Jesus crucified on a tree. Jesus countered that by raising from the grave and conquering death, hell, and the grave. And then God made the final move by coming to dwell in our hearts and giving us kingdom authority. All the moves and counter moves comes back to us. Even before Jesus was crucified, the plan was already in place. You know, uh, John chapter 8, verse 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And the message translation says it this way. Jesus once again addressed them. I am the world's light. No one who follows me stumbles around in the darkness. I provide plenty of light to live in. So Jesus declared himself, I am the light of the world. And it was one of the seven I am declarations that Jesus made. Matthew chapter four, verse 16. The people who sat, dwelt, enveloped in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the land and shadow of death, light has dawned. So because Jesus came, the light manifested in the world and the people who were dwelling in darkness saw this light. John chapter 9 and verse 5 says, As long as I am with you, my life is the light that pierces the world's darkness. So Jesus lets them know that he is the light of the world. His light pierces the darkness. But he also lets them know that he's not going to always be with them here on the earth in physical form. So what's going to happen when he's gone? What's going to happen after the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension? Well, the prophet Isaiah foretold of what would happen in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2. He said, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. So in Matthew, Jesus reveals his plan. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And he came as that final counter move to what Satan had been doing against mankind. He, he gained back man, the authority that man had lost in the fall. And then he declares that the ministry he started was not gonna end when he ascended into heaven, but he was giving that ministry to the church to continue here on the earth. He is the light and he was the light when he was on the earth. But now we are the light that is supposed to pierce 
the darkness. Are you with me? Now, here's the challenge for us. As society becomes more divided and divisive, Christians are tempted to withdraw from what we would call the culture wars. The more secular our culture becomes, the more absent God seems. This seemingly absence of God is not because God's no longer present. It's because the church is being overcome by culture and they are becoming overcome by culture because the church has become like the culture. The needed contrast has instead become a blend. Right? Second Corinthians chapter six says it this way. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, when I was growing up, our church took that literally where it says, come out from among them and be separate. All right. Now, what I mean by that is, although I went to public school, we were not allowed to associate with anyone or anything that was not Christian. You know, I was not allowed to play Little League because there were sinners that played Little League. They weren't, it wasn't a church Little League team. So we weren't allowed to participate in any of those kind of things. We did not uh, go to many extended family gatherings because the extended family were not Christians, right? So we had very little association, especially with my dad's side of the family because, you know, they, they were not Christian. They you know, whereas my mom's side of the family, half of them were, half of them weren't. So at least we could go to reunions there because and then we hang out with the Christians, right? So there was just the separation that took place. We had no association with anyone that was not a sinner or that was not a Christian. Our, our church, when I think about it, really didn't have any form of outreach. And the only reason why anyone ever got saved because was at that time, there was at least this moral foundation in this country where people, they knew about the Bible, they knew about sin, and so they, they pretty much figured out they were sinners and they needed to be saved. And when the, uh, a crisis occurred in their life or by some freak thing where a Christian would actually and get the nerve to invite them to come to church, they would come to church, be exposed to the gospel and get saved. Because we didn't go out and talk to anyone. When you worked, you just kind of hung by yourself. You just didn't associate with people. That kind of separation was never God's intention, nor was that what he was referring to in these verses. So let's listen to this in a different translation. Don't continue to team up with unbelievers and mismatched alliances for what partnership is there between righteousness and rebellion? Who could mingle light with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What fellowship does God's temple have with demons? For indeed, we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, I will make my home in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. For this reason, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch nothing that is unclean and I will embrace you. I will be a true father to you and you will be my beloved sons and daughters, says the Lord Yahweh Almighty. So these verses are really not talking about us having no contact with the world. I mean, because we work in the world, we live in the world, we go to the grocery store in the world. All of those, you know, we, we have associations there. We are in the world, but really it's talking about not becoming like the world. We are to be a separate people. People should be able to look at us and see that there's a difference. And it's also talking about not getting into any uh, agreements with people that are not Christians. And this is especially true in the area of marriage. You know, uh, we, we tell young people all of the time, do not date someone that is not a Christian. 
And this is especially true for girls because girls give their heart at the drop of a hat. I mean, they, they look at this good looking guy and all of a sudden they're madly in love. And by, by the time, you know, and, and some people call it missionary dating. Well, I'm gonna date that person because I believe God wants me to win them to the Lord. And what happens is, is you give your heart away and before you know it, you're married. And the most important thing that should be the basis of the marriage is not there. And there's going to be conflict all your life. So I'm just saying, don't missionary date. Any teenagers in here that are single? If that boy or that girl doesn't know Jesus, don't even think about it. All right? You know, one of the things that I'll tell you about this, because there are some guys that... You know, they want to come to church and they want to find a girl because the girls are in church are good, all right? They want to get a good girl. And so they come to church. And here's the way that I can tell if they're really sincere about the things of God. Do they come when that girl is not here? Or do they just come when the girl is here because they want to impress them and think, make them think that they're really serious about God? And one thing I can say about my son-in-law, when, when Dave and Katie were dating, Dave did come here to church for a girl. <laughs> the first Sunday he was here, we had Jeff and Krista were up here, and we said, if anybody has a need, come up and pray. And he came up, and they said, Jeff, uh, they said, Dave, what do you want? He said, I want a good Christian girl. <laughs> and no, be the pastor's daughter. <laughs> but at that time, Katie was doing a lot of traveling for work. And he was here every Sunday. She was gone. And that let me know he's really serious about the things of God. He's just not after my daughter. But well, that's one of the things I look for when this takes place. Are they really serious or is the, are they just trying to impress the other person? That's my soapbox. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Satan has two primary strategies in attacking the church. And one is the frontal assault, which is re is persecution. You know, um, persecution cost Christians their life throughout history. And even places in the world today, such as China and some of the Muslim countries, and even especially Northern India, where Hindus are actually, uh, a few years ago, these Hindus burned a, past a Christian pastor and his son in his car. They just set the car on fire and just watched him burn, watched him burn. Horrible things are happening in foreign countries, and you would think that, you know, that, that that would turn people against serving God. But it's been said that the the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And in those places where persecution is going on, these Christians have more dedication to God. They're a pure church. They're a more dedicated church. They're a more on fire church than in places where there's no persecution. They will walk for days to, to, to be at a church service when they know something's going on. And, and, and sometimes we have a hard time getting to church if it rains. So persecution is going on in the world. Last year I visited Tajikistan, and it's not as bad as some of the other Muslim countries, but we still had to hide to be able to teach the word of God because we would have been arrested and we would have has, you know, been put in jail. But the enemy's second strategy is, is more subtle. Rather than having opposition between secular culture and Christian culture, he wants to align them. He wants secular culture and Christian culture to be the same. And this is happening in the world today because many of the mainline churches have moved away from their biblical foundations and are, and are now embracing the secular culture morals. So the world or the church is allowing the world to dictate what the culture and the beliefs of the church should be. That somehow the word of God changes because society changes. Our belief system is changing, and then our lifestyles are being compromised. So really, Satan invites the church to give the people what they want at the expense of biblical teaching that confronts sin and encourages re repentance. And so many of the churches in the United States are pretty wide, but they're not very deep. 
They're shallow and they teach a convenient faith. And a convenient faith is one that only takes just a little bit of effort to try to fit into our lifestyle. And the enemy is okay with that because he knows it's a shallow faith that is that 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 will falter when it's challenged. In Jesus' parable of the sowers, he said that the seeds that were sown with no depth of soil were scorched by the sun and they withered away. Very little soil. They're scorched by the sun. And all the way, Satan wants us to judge our faith by our circumstances. You know, we live in a fallen state. We live in a fallen world. So there are going to be things that happen in life that disappoint us and, just, and, and challenge us. And, and, and when those things happen in life, instead of turning to God, we blame God. We're disappointed in God. And so we kind of turn away from God. So it, it starts this cycle where the less we trust our Lord, the less we pray. And the less we pray, the less we trust God. And sometimes the opposite is true. When things are tough, we turn to God. When things are great, we become complacent. So for many Christians, the Christian faith is either shallow or it's circumstantial. It's based on our circumstances. Still with me? Yeah. But God, I believe, has high hopes for the church, and he's got a great destiny for us. And it involves two primary things. It involves experiencing God's fullness, and it involves transforming our world. So experiencing God's fullness involves getting to know God, pressing into him, becoming the light he has ordained us to be. And here's some scriptures that go along with that. Psalm 36, verse 9. To know you, speaking of God, is to experience a flowing fountain, drinking in your life, springing up to satisfy. In the light of your holiness, we receive the light of revelation. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Luke chapter 11, verses 34 through 36 in the Passion Translation. The eyes of your spirit allow revelation light to enter into your being. When your heart is open, the light floods in. When your heart is hard and closed, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place. Open your heart and consider my words. Watch out that you do not mistake your opinions for revelation light. I love that line. We have to base our belief system on the word of God, not ours or someone else's opinion. Right? So you have to know the word enough to know what to believe. And then verse 36, if your spirit burns with light, fully illuminated with no trace of darkness, you will be a shining lamp reflecting rays of truth by the way that you live. So the entrance of God's word brings light. This means that when we read God's word, our lives should reflect his word. That means that our lives are to change and become more like Jesus. We will never be the light that God wants us to be in the world unless we are different from the world. Did you hear me? I'll say it again. We will never be the light that God wants us to be in the world unless we're different from the world. Right. Yeah. Romans 13, verse 12. Night's darkness is dissolving away as a new day of destiny dawns. So we must once and for all strip away what is done in the shadows of darkness, removing it like filthy clothes. And once and for all, we clothe ourselves with the radiance of light as our weapon. Ephesians 5 eight, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That same verse in another translation says, once your life is full of sin's darkness, <clears throat> but now you have the very light of our Lord shining through you because of your union with him. Your mission is to live as children flooded with his revelation light and the supernatural fruits of this light will be seen in you. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Then you will learn to choose what is beautiful to our Lord. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And then the most, most pointed verse, I love Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, and any translation I've read it, I just love to read that. But in the Barclay translation, it says, don't try to match your life to all the fashions of the world. Don't be like the chameleon, which takes its color from its surroundings. 
Don't go with the world. Don't let the world decide what you are going to be like. Amen. I love that. Don't let the world decide what you're going to be like. You be different. Being different is the only way that we're going to make a difference. And the reality is, is if we're not different, we're not going to make an impact on anyone. We cannot compromise our lifestyle to reach the lost. Instead of changing the world, the world's changing the church. So here's, here's a couple questions. Do the people you work with know you're a Christian? We don't have to go around preaching at everyone, and we shouldn't. I, I don't believe that. We shouldn't. But there should be something different about us that causes them to ask questions. And it can be simple things. I, I remember years ago, I was working, and, and um, there was threats of layoffs. And, you know, and, and there, I, I was working with this young guy, and of course, I was young back then, too. Younger. And um, every Thursday at lunchtime, he would go out and cash his check, and then he would come back in. And, and I would watch him just sit there and he'd go through his money and he was counting everything and he was writing things down. And I could tell that he was trying to figure out how he was gonna pay his bills. And he was on the same level as me as far as if layoffs happened, you know, we, we would be there. And finally he looked at me one day and he says, why don't you worry about this? I don't see you ever concerned about the rumors that we're hearing. And I told him, I said, because I have a God who I serve, who takes care of me, and this job is not my source, and if for some reason they don't want me here anymore, he'll have something else for me. I have that confidence. That's right. So just in something as simple as that, not worrying, you know, just seeing that, open the door for me to be able to share life with him. What about the unsafe friends you've been hanging out with? for years. Do they see a difference in you or do they just, do you just seem to fit in with the whole game? Is there something in your life that even raises a question why you're different? Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel everywhere and if you have to, use words. So that means that whether we're saying anything or not, just the very, just who we are should preach the gospel to the people that are around us. Amen. There should be something. I, I, I think there's a, I hate to use this word because it sounds new agey, but you, you know what I mean? There, there should be an aura around us. There's, there's just this light that should shine around us. And when you go someplace, people should be able to look and we stand out in the midst of the darkness. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses five through eight says, you're you are sons of light, daughters of day. We live under wide open skies and know where we stand. So let's not sleepwalk through life like those others. Let's keep our eyes open and be smart. People sleep at night and get drunk at night, but not us. Since we, we are creatures of day, let's act like it. Walk out into the daylight sober, dressed up in faith, love, and the hope of salvation. So we're to be different, and we are commissioned to transform the world around us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this, But you are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. For at one time you were not God's people, but now you are. At one time you knew nothing of God's mercy because you had not received it, but now you are drenched with it. I love that. We are drenched with God's mercy so that we can share his mercy with others. And we that have experienced God's mercy should want the people around us to experience that same mercy. You know, sometimes we don't share our faith because we are concerned about offending someone, especially a friend, or we feel like we may lose a friendship if we share our faith. But think about it this way. Do we truly love our friends if we never share the gospel with them? 
and just let them go into eternity without hearing the gospel from us. Right. Does that make a difference to us at all? So, so the big question to us is, is this. Is it okay with us that the people around us go to hell when they die? Is it okay? No. Right, let, let, let me illustrate it this way. This is the world without Jesus. This is your workplace. This is your community. This is your neighborhood. This is your school. It's dark. And people are stumbling in darkness. And because the church hasn't been the light, the darkness remains. But what if we shine our light? Now, when that light went on, I think most everybody in here turned and looked at it. Why? Because that light is different than what we're experiencing, right? And darkness, as dark as it was in here before, darkness cannot overpower that light. As long as it's got good batteries. <laughs> One light makes a difference. Amen. But what if there's another light? it becomes a little brighter. What if there's another light? And another. And another. As we share the light wherever we are, the darkness has to flee. And the light becomes greater. And light begins to come into the places where darkness has been. When you go into your workplace, it's dark, but you go in with the light of God and you light up that workplace. When you as a student go into the school, you are light and you light up that school. Wherever you go, see yourselves as light. You are instruments of light that God wants to use to bring his light to the world that is around us. And the more each of us shine that light, the more light will be in this place. So our world isn't dark anymore, but it becomes light. And we can raise the lights back up. Light overpowers darkness. Amen. We have to be light in the dark world, and it's time to shine. And, and I just want to read one more passage of scripture from Acts chapter 26, verses 17, 18 in the, in the Message Bible. I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders so that they can see the difference between dark and light, and choose light. To see the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family, inviting them into the company of those who began real living by believing in me. He's sending us off to show people the difference between light and darkness so they choose light. The difference between God and Satan so they choose God to be able to enter into this new life that he has for them. We are the reason that darkness came into the world and we are the reason that light came into the world. And the light that we have experienced, God wants us to, to show forth to the world that is around us so that people around us see the light. And so I'm just commissioning us again, all as a church, to be light 
wherever we are, wherever we go. Be different. Be God's instruments of righteousness to bring light to a dark world. Can we do that? Yeah.